This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. In this episode, we will discuss mindful eating, intuitive eating, and the most common cognitive distortions. How many times have you reached for the snacks at a party and munched through them without thinking? Or ordered dessert even though you were already full, just because it looked so good? We eat for many reasons. Because we're stressed or feeling sad. Because we feel like we deserve a treat. Or simply because it's our scheduled mealtime. Eating mindfully is about expanding our awareness around food habits so that we can make more conscious decisions about what we eat and when. According to Jan Chosenbeis, MD, author of the book, Mindful Eating, there are seven different types of hunger relating to different parts of our anatomy. Once we are more aware of these different types of hunger and their reasons, we can respond consciously and more appropriately to satisfy them. Valeria interviews Chelsea DeChico. She is the owner of Chelsea DeChico Counseling Services, LLC. She is a licensed professional counselor in the state of Connecticut, and she provides individual therapy services to adults struggling with anxiety, depression, life changes and transitions, trauma, disordered eating behaviors, and body image. Chelsea attended the University of New Haven for both her bachelor's and master's degrees and started her career doing home therapy with children and families. After that, she went on to work at an outpatient eating disorder clinic. In 2018, Chelsea decided her next move was to start her own private practice, and it has been an incredibly rewarding experience that she is grateful for every single day. Starting therapy can be a really new and scary experience for many. Chelsea believes that a therapeutic relationship is a very special and unique type of relationship that can allow for and facilitate self-reflection, self-growth, and self-love. A therapeutic relationship can allow you to be vulnerable without judgment and creates a safe space for you to explore your truest self. Chelsea's goal in her practice is to provide relief from emotional distress and to work with her clients through the difficult process of healing. Her therapeutic approach is strength-based and client-centered, meaning she is here to support her clients and wants to hear their story. Meet Chelsea at chelseadechicocounseling.com. Here's the interview with Chelsea DeChico. In your own words, who is Chelsea DeChico? When I think about that question, I think about the personal aspect of my life and the professional one. Personally, I'm a first-time mom, so I have a two-year-old daughter, and that's a certainly in this season of my life, that's a, a big kind of identifying factor of who I am right now as being a mom. And it's it's taught me so much about myself and kind of the world and my my outlooks on things. So that's been a really cool experience for me. Um, and then in my professional life, I, I kind of like to identify as a, a supportive person, like a support in people's lives, um, as well as someone who kind of helps to facilitate healing. Um, I like to kind of think about that because I think people are so resilient. Human beings are so resilient and sometimes they just need someone in their corner. And so kind of thinking of myself as, as that type of person. That's beautiful. I love everything about it. Thank you. <laughs> I mentioned off record and I often say that there's something beautiful about helping ourselves and others at the same time, doing mm-hmm. this work of helping one another. I think it has to do with community too, and especially when it has to do with healing, it's closer to my heart, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So 
A question came to me that's not here. It was not planned. When, when you talked about your daughter, the experience of being a mother, what lessons do you clearly see that we can learn from children, all of us? I mean, I think it's, it's first of all, amazing just to see things. I think people say this all the time, but seeing things through a child's eyes, like they, they don't have we all have history, right? The older you get, you have history and like those experiences change who you are and how you see the world and how you see other people. It's a lot of what I like to bring into my practice, kind of the the way we see the world and these kind of thinking patterns that we have come from different life experiences and they don't have any of those yet. So everything is really kind of pure and like over just simple. I don't want to say oversimplified, but it's just simple. It's kind of face value, I guess, um, without all of these other kind of things that get in the way. And, and so that's just really cool. And it kind of, it forces you sometimes to slow down. We're always running and thinking about, I don't know, a million different things and interpreting things in a million different ways. And sometimes just to see things like really, you know, in a, from a simple lens is, is good. It, it forces you to just slow down. That makes me think about some of the highest spiritual teachings that is yeah, staying yeah. here in the moment and staying present to what is present and not being yes, in the past and the that. future. So that's interesting that you say that because that came yeah. to me like, hey, okay, so this is a children, they teach us to be in the moment. How amazing. Yeah. And I wonder if it is totally from your perspective as a professional as well, Chelsea, is that really realistic and possible to get to return to this way of perceiving life? Um, I guess every, maybe different people would have a different opinion on that. I think my opinion would be that it's, it's possible to work through things that have changed your life perspective or your lens in a way that doesn't serve you. Um, however, I think we have, you know, as you live each year, you kind of, you know, more you've li lived through more. And some of that is a good thing, right? Like some of that lived experience is, is a positive thing and serves us, but I don't necessarily think we can get rid of those chapters in our life, but we can find different ways to, you know, give them meaning or, or, you know, the, the ways that maybe again, aren't serving us anymore or getting in the way of things. I think there's certainly ways to eliminate or minimize mm, yes, those. Yes. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. Resonates true. It's uh, yeah. almost like, um, good. not a, re a replacement, but it's a new way of seeing, isn't it? Because you're right, we exactly. cannot really get rid of the past of those memories. A lot of times we can't. So it's the way we interpret them, the way we kind of find a new meaning for them. That has been my experience. Exactly. Exactly. And something I love kind of talking about in my practice is um, I have a lot of clients who have kind of expressed not loving the phrase, everything happens for a reason, that that sometimes minimizes their experiences or makes it sound like, you know, it has to be a good thing. And, and I, I totally, you know, understand that. So I try to talk about giving experiences that maybe aren't so great or that we wish didn't happen, trying to find meaning in them. And sometimes that takes years to find the meaning or to give it meaning. But I think that's totally possible if there's, you know, things in your life that are challenging or difficult to find a way to give them meaning that, you know, resonates with you and that feels like a positive yes. thing. A trillion times to the process, even even saying yes yeah. to the process of healing or the uncovering exactly. who we are and the way we process information in our belief systems. And with that in mind, how did you become a mental health counselor? I would love to know that story. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I certainly had interest in psychology ever since I would say like sophomore year of high school. I took, you know, very basic high school um, psychology classes and I always found it fascinating. I think it's amazing how, again, resilient human beings are and just the range of emotions we experience and the way our brains work. I think it's all fascinating. So I knew from early on that I wanted to kind of go into this field. And so I did my bachelor's um, in psychology and then my master's. I went right into my master's. And then after that, I started working right away. And I worked with lots of different people in different communities and all different ages um, and walks of life. And and I've always loved it. It's certainly challenging work, but um, I, I never kind of for a second, which I, I find I feel very lucky for that because I think a lot of people search for a long time for what they're passionate about and you know, what they want their career path to be. And I kind of, I felt this was right for me. And, and 
it was. And, and so that's kind of, I, I really knew ever since I would say high school that this is what I wanted to do. And each time I had more experience or a job or an internship, it kind of further validated oh, wow. that. It's almost like whatever we are doing now, or the purpose we have, have found us. We didn't find it. Yes. <laughs> it feels that way. Another open question is about mental health in general. How do you define mental health? What is to be mentally healthy from your perspective? Yeah, um, I think from my perspective, it's being, it's having awareness. So just being aware of your emotions and allowing yourself to experience them. You know, we all have a full range of emotions and some of them can be really tough and some of them can be really great, but being aware of them and then being able to regulate them and cope with them in a, and again, I'm going to use the word healthy and, and, um, we're trying to define that too, but I guess in a way that, isn't hurting you and isn't hurting anybody else a, a way that's productive, I guess we could use that word. And so, you know, I talk a lot about coping skills. It's kind of a a buzzword these days, I guess. But, you know, just when you're having a tougher day, there's really kind of unhealthy, like maladaptive ways of coping with stuff. Um, and then there's healthier ways, which kind of it gets you through it versus trying mm. to get around it. Oh, I love that. The idea of going yeah. through it anyway. It has been, yeah. you've probably yes. heard about that pushing away pain is not a good thing because it doesn't go away really. It always exactly. stays there. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of, you know, sometimes we look for um, instant gratification or of course we hate to feel as humans, like no one wants to feel bad. And so whether you're depressed or just sad or down or having a bad day, I think kind of your first natural instinct is just to want to avoid it or push it away. And so I think part of being mentally well um, is, you know, learning to sit with it and deal with it in a way that you're honoring that emotion mm, and working through yes, it. Yes, I love that. Beautifully said, Chelsea. And I love the way you, you said also mentally well instead of mentally healthy. Mm. <laughs> that resonates yeah. more than the word health for some reason. I think what I want to know or something in me wants to know is why are we here? That's like a, a fundamental question. So I like to think, and again, kind of going back to um, my drive, I guess, to want to be in this healing field is I like to believe I, it was always important to me to be in a field that was, you know, interacting with other people and in some way helping other people. And I think there are so many professions that do that. Um, but I, I do feel whether, you know, that resonates on a spiritual level or religious or whatever for, you know, any different people, I feel like our purpose is to an extent to, to serve and, and help other people, kind of our community, our neighbors, our friends, our family, even strangers. I think that that's, that's um, a big part of our purpose being here. I love that answer. And I have heard it so many times that made me curious to know why even. Do you have an idea why do we have, yeah. we feel so strongly about helping others and connecting? Is that because we are already connected <laughs> in a way? <laughs> yeah, I think so. And and I love the word. Sometimes I talk a lot about like empathy versus sympathy and how sympathy is kind of feeling sorry for someone, but empathy is trying to like understand that feeling, whether you've experienced something similar, you haven't at all, just being able to say, wow, like I really see that, you know, I can see that you're hurting and you're in pain and, and you know, I want to be able to understand that and help you. And I, I feel like we whether that goes away for some people or not, again, verse, you know, based on life experiences, I kind of feel like we're all born with that, like this innate empathy just to want to understand and, and help other people, especially if it's something you could, you know, resonate with, if it's something similar that you've been through. I think we've all experienced joy and pain in our lives. So to see someone else hurting, um, you know, I think we have that kind of deep down in all of us to want to, yeah, to help. Yeah, I Absolutely agree. Some of us are kind of exposed that side much more for some reason. I see women, mm -hmm. they're very good at it, very empathic. And I wonder what is the reason why some people are not. I have family members and some of them are not as empathic as others. And some of them, not, yeah. they're not at all. They, if you tell them anything that you've been, been through, you're going through, they kind of brush it off pretty quickly. So, I'm, uh -huh. yeah, I kind of observe and I wonder what happened to them for not being in touch with that innate yeah. part of them. Right. It's it's so interesting, I think. And I think there's so many 
factors. Like there's certainly cultural factors um, and that, you know, can even go back culturally, just how people are raised and how their parents raised them. And it, it kind of, there's like this interesting nature versus nurture concept of, you know, two people could have the same parents, the same DNA, um, and how much of that makes us who we are and how much of it is just, you know, inside of us, just it's innate, it's natural and how much of it is our experiences and the people we've encountered in our lives or, you know, trauma or whatever it is. So I think there, there are so many different factors. I, I think some of it to an extent is like a personality trait. Some people are more, um, sensitive, empathetic, emotional, you know, emotionally in tune than other people. And then some of it certainly can be life experiences. Sometimes people just have life experiences that kind of harden us, I think. That also makes a lot of sense, resonates true, especially when it comes to trauma, right, Chelsea? Yeah. So mm -hmm. once we become traumatized, then it's so much more challenging to uncover, right? Yes. These oh, absolutely. Parts of us. Yeah. And trauma is so fascinating. I'm certainly not an, an expert necessarily, but I, I do work with, you know, with some trauma in my practice and it's it, what people perceive as trauma is so different, right? It's it, it, some people might perceive one thing as traumatic or someone else may not. So it's all just how it impacts you and how you perceive it. But it certainly changes our brain and it changes the way we perceive, you know, ourselves and the world and other people. And so and some people have, you know, multiple traumatic experiences. So it really can change. Sometimes that makes you more empathetic. And sometimes, again, kind of the term I'm, you know, coming to mind is kind of like it yeah. hardens you and it, it closes yes, you up a little right. bit. Yes, right. That's how I describe the closing of the heart. So the heart is not open. Yeah, right? exactly. I'm not going to even ask you the question about how to deal with that desire to change others because we can't do that unless they are open. Right, Chelsea? Right. Exactly. Exactly. And that's a hard one. And I think sometimes people think, <clears throat> you know, um, just kind of showing up to therapy will somehow fix things. And to an extent, I mean, I've had sessions for sure where there's work that can be done through the silence and just being in the presence of someone, you know, is in your corner, or believes in you and wants to help you. There's value to that for sure. But certainly you have to be open to the process and to healing to get anything out of it. And so that is a hard one. Sometimes you connect with clients or I'll connect with someone who I think I want their healing more than they do in that moment. And that's tough. Speaking of healing, besides not being open to the healing process, what are some other, let's say, obstacles to healing from your view? Yeah, um, you know, I think that, again, whether it's life experiences, family is a really big one, family dynamics in childhood. But sometimes there are things that really, um, you know, your self-esteem and your self-worth take a beating. And so if that self-worth is not there, that's something I run into a lot is kind of a barrier to, to healing or a barrier to treatment is if you don't have, you know, the self-worth to feel like I deserve to get better, or even a little part of you feels you deserve healing and you deserve to get better, that can be really tough. And again, that's something you can work through because sometimes in therapy, your therapist is maybe one of the first people who has believed in you and, and, you know, enforced that you deserve good things and you deserve a good life. And so sometimes that process, you know, can push through that barrier, but that can be a big one, that, that self-worth yeah, piece. That's another beautiful element in healing. And I'm glad you said that. I love to talk and write about self-love and self-worth. Yes. Um, wow. That's another big one. And it seems to be yes. common sense, right, Chelsea, to love ourselves, to care for ourselves, but it yeah. doesn't really happen as often as we right. would love to. Do you know why we sometimes um, are kinder to others than ourselves? I think sometimes a lot of, actually a lot of times people express that they, they're they so able to love others or care for others because they see the value and the worth in them. It's kind of like, you know, from the outside, you're able to identify all these really great things about your friends or your family or your peers. And so you want good for them, but you, again, somewhere along the way have lost the ability to see that in yourself. And so, you know, it's, it's much easier. And sometimes I guess that's kind of goes back to your previous question. That can be a barrier too, where people are so busy. They, they just turn, it's almost like a, a, 
a great quality that turns into a not so great one that they pour them themselves into just this nurturing role and all they do is take care of others and they kind of identify with being a caretaker. And so you're giving, giving, giving to someone else or everyone else just to distract from the fact that like you need something, you need, you need love and, and you don't really, you're not ready to look at that yet or address that. And so sometimes taking care of other people is a way to distract from that in a really bizarre way, you know, to think it's, it's interesting to think of it that way, but yeah, wow. certainly. That's another one that resonates true. Uh, I can see yeah. that. I remember myself doing that for a long time, running from my own needs and trying to help others yes. from a place of lack, really. And that never worked. Never did. Absolutely. And I think it's so common in any type of healing profession or people who are empaths to want to, even if it's not for distraction, sometimes just stopping yourself and saying, okay, I'm, I'm pouring a lot into others than I am myself right now. And you can't pour from an empty cup, right? So if you're not taking care of yourself, how much can you really give yes. anybody else? Yes, absolutely. And that goes back to that piece of awareness that you spoke earlier. Being, being aware of that, mm-hmm. which is um, uh, it's another work practice in itself. <laughs> what is the world's greatest need from your view? I think kindness. And, and I really love that word. It's one I've just started recently using with my daughter. I think it's so much different than being nice. It's just being kind, you know, caring about other people and going even just slightly out of your way for someone else thinking outside of just your world, there may be an issue that doesn't impact you directly, but it's impacting somebody else and somebody else is hurting or a lot of other people are hurting. And just that basic kind of, you know, openness to looking outside of just yourself or your little family or your home and thinking about, you know, practicing kindness towards other people. Let's talk about some of the services that you offer. You offer individual therapy and also accelerated resolution therapy, which I never heard about it. So I'd love to hear about that. And it's the abbreviation is ART, which is kind of inspiring (laughs) to look at it. Yes. Yeah. Um, Are you familiar with EMDR therapy? So it's very similar with the rap using the rapid eye movements um, to treat generally to treat trauma. Um, So it's kind of the idea EMDR focuses more on the thoughts around trauma and ART is more around the images associated with trauma. So almost imagining that, you know, whether it's flashbacks or or nightmares or whatever, the the images you have um, attached to your trauma and trying to kind of, you know, access this part of your brain that's kind of opened up with the rapid eye movement. So you're kind of following a moving hand. Um, That's how you, you your eyes are moving from left to right. Um, and it can kind of access that part of your brain that's holding on to those images associated to the trauma. Yeah, it is yeah, fascinating. It's fascinating. I, wow, and that, I kind of like that better. If I were to do kind of uh, therapy for trauma, this yeah. one would probably work a lot more for me because visuals, I'm very visual and also, yeah, more creative in the way. Exactly. <laughs> I never heard about this type of therapy. So thank you for explaining that, Chelsea. Yeah. I know you own, it's a private practice that you own called Chelsea De Chico yeah. Counseling Services. Do you offer online sessions yes. besides in person? Yes, I do. And it was, it was um, kind of just a uh, it was m- maybe I had one or two clients who were doing it pre COVID, but now obviously with the pandemic, everyone moved over to telehealth. Um, and I just recently started offering in person again. So right now, 90% of my caseload is, um, through telehealth, which is all virtual. And I have a few people who come into the office again. The topics that we will talk for a moment will be mindfulness and mindful eating. So I guess the first question is about what mindfulness is and also how do you describe the practice of mindful eating? Yeah, so um, I describe mindfulness as just kind of being in the present moment being aware of what's happening in the moment. Our, our brains are so accustomed to thinking forward, thinking backwards, you know, in the past, future, and it's so easy to do. And so I often encourage people to use, you know, their senses to practice mindfulness. So if you're kind of, your mind is floating away day to day, just like, what do you see in the room or what do you see outside and what do you hear and what do you smell? And that can be a great way to ground you to the present moment. And the more you practice that, the more it kind of becomes a natural way of 
of being or of existing, you know, moment to moment. So that's kind of how I would describe mindfulness is being mindful of being in the present moment. Yeah. So kind of one of the things, uh, one of the, you know, main places I would start with mindful eating is slowing down. Again, oftentimes our lives are so fast paced. So you're just wolfing down something before your next meeting or before you're, you know, whatever someone comes to the house or whatever you're doing running around. So slowing down and tasting your food and smelling your food and just enjoying it um, is, is a great way to practice mindful eating. Cause sometimes, I don't know, we've all probably experienced this, but you sit down and you have a lunch and you're watching TV or you're rushing, rushing cause you have five minutes and you can't remember eating it. You didn't really experience it. You just got it in so that you could keep going with your day. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing how we do that without yeah, even thinking. It's just uh, right. it has become a bad habit really. yeah. or a habit, I would say. It's just exactly. a habit that's not serving us. <laughs> exactly. As you said earlier, you sent me a blog post about a topic that I've never heard before. The blog post is titled Understanding the Seven Types of Hunger. Yep. I would love for you to um, talk to me about these seven types of hunger, describe them. And I also would love to know about intuitive eating, but this is, uh, I'll ask you questions after that. So, okay. Yeah. They kind of, you know, intertwine really well, but yeah. yeah so there's the, the seven types of hunger. It's usually something that right when I start talking about it, no one's ever heard of it. It, it comes from um, a book that we had used and I wish I had the, the, name of the book off the top of my head, but it was a chapter in there that we had used um, when I worked at an eating disorder clinic and primarily with clients struggling with binge eating disorder. And it was, um, you know, something that right when you start talking about it, everyone can resonate with it. You just don't always know it as the seven hungers, but um, they describe it as eye hunger, nose hunger, mouth hunger, stomach, cellular, mind, and heart. And so when you think about, again, something we've all experienced where you're eating and something really tastes delicious, and so your stomach is full, you're physically full, but your mouth wants more because it tastes really good or it smells really good. That's kind of that nose hunger. It smells really good. Um, heart hunger is a really interesting one because sometimes we eat to fill an emotional void. You know, so again, physically you're full, but there's something, you know, whether it's boredom or sadness or loneliness or whatever you are eating to fill that heart hunger. And so these aren't bad hungers, but they're important to, you know, know so that we can honor them. It's okay to say, okay, I'm stuffed, but like this cake tastes delicious. So I'll allow myself to have one more bite or, you know, I'm actually physically, you know, if I eat more, I'll be physically uncomfortable and I'm craving more, but I'm not actually honoring my physical hunger. It's just that my mouth thinks it tastes good. And so that's just mouth hunger. So just, again, that awareness is key because then you're in control of making that, that next decision versus thinking, oh, I'm just hungry. And all hunger comes from, you know, this one's same place. My body is still hungry and therefore I have to keep eating. And that's why intuitive eating, it's very important because we are kind of almost outside of the mind realm, the thought patterns. Right, exactly. exactly. Yeah, but how do you define intuitive eating? I would love to hear the description of that because I heard so many of them. Yeah, I think on a really basic level, I would describe it as... Um, you know, being able to recognize when you're hungry and when you're full and then honoring those cues. I think it goes a little deeper into enjoying food and knowing what you're craving, knowing what your body wants, being able to, you know, understand what foods you enjoy and don't enjoy. Because with diet culture is something I talk a lot about. And I think it's just shoved down all of our throats. And it has been for a very long time. It's so common in our, in our society. Um, but we've really been taught in a lot of ways to, you know, you want this, but eat this. This is a, oh, you want cake? This is a really great healthy replacement. Or if you're craving chocolate, here's what you can eat instead or whatever the case may be. So intuitive eating is kind of like I want, you know, chocolate. So I'm going to eat chocolate, but I can also recognize when my stomach has had enough or I'm feeling full and I'm not going to push past that feeling, you know, or diet culture might, there's, I don't know, there's, um, intermittent fasting and all these different things where, okay, I'm hungry, but it's 7am and I'm not allowed to eat until nine or 10. So all of those kind of diety rules and food rules go against intuitive eating. When it comes to intuitive eating, I think about, of course, intuition. 
Mm-hmm, and exactly. even making decisions in life and, uh, you know, what to do, what not to do in the moment. How do we learn to, besides becoming body aware, which is very important, mm-hmm. but how do we learn to more accurately identify those thoughts or ideas that come from the mind, belief systems, and then the ones that come from that deeper place that I call the heart or the soul? Yeah, I would love to know this how do you dance around intuition <laughs> i know it's 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 tough and i think i'm thinking back to kind of what we were talking about earlier with kids and just how their yeah. view is so simple mm. and their intuition yeah. is so spot on because there's nothing else throwing it off right just what they think or what they feel is what they follow and we have so many different things that get in the way and sometimes we've been Again, I'm thinking to like diet culture and food rules that sometimes our intuition says like, I want this thing and I should be able to have this thing. But we've got, you know, life gets messy where you've been taught other rules or you followed this diet for years or someone told you this thing was really bad. And so you have those voices floating around. And sometimes it's hard to get back in touch with your intuition because you have all these other you know, thoughts and ideas that really cloud it. And and I think a huge part of healing for a lot of people is relearning how to trust your intuition. And you have to start somewhere, right? So you just start with, okay, I'm thinking or feeling this thing. And there's something inside of me that's telling me it's wrong, but I feel like it's right. And so I'm going to follow that. It takes practice, doesn't it? It totally does. Mm, yeah. To yeah. Because we really lose our way sometimes. And, you, you know, you think you can't be trusted for whatever reason, but oftentimes our intuition is pretty spot on. You just have to listen to it. And going back to the 10 principles of intuitive eating, there's one of them, number three says, make peace with food. And also number four, challenge the food police. That has been a tough one for me. I do follow this, although I eat the same foods almost every day. Yep. It's not really a diet that I adopted from elsewhere. It's something that works for my body and mine. Yeah. Like twice a day and I eat the same things pretty much. I would love to know if this is already some sort of programming or am I really kind of fixed on that intuitive knowing that chooses the right foods for my body and mine? Right. Yeah. I think that, you know, the, the, again, with the big piece with the intuitive eating is that your body will speak to you if you're listening. Right. And so Mm -hmm. there, there would certainly be a moment in which you're experiencing hunger, but you're ignoring it or you're dreading a meal because it feels boring or mundane, but you're forcing yourself to eat it or you're craving something, but you're not allowed to have it. If there are those rules, that's kind of one thing. But if you find yourself, you know, honoring your hunger and your body feels satisfied and you enjoy your food and it feels there's there's another one on the intuitive eating list that's kind of about satisfaction right it's one thing to be full you could fill yourself with food in a volume sense but if you're not finding the food satisfying or satiating those are you know other important components to eating so i would say like if if all of those boxes are checked for you then you are eating intuitively Mm, yeah even if i'm eating the same foods, right? Right. If you enjoy those foods and, you know, you're not dreading them and you're not craving other things that you're not allowing yourself, Mm. then yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The mind makes judgments about certain foods like Mm -hmm. cakes and let's say butter and all that because I don't have those things. Milk, I don't drink milk. But my body doesn't crave these things, but the mind tends to judge them as bad in a way or not healthy for my body and mind. Do I have a bad relationship with food by judging them bad? I wouldn't say bad at all because I think it's really common. And and I always love to tell my clients that foods don't have morals, right? So there are no (laughs) good foods and bad (laughs) foods. It's all just food. And I like to say that, you know, all food is good food in moderation. (laughs) Um, So I would certainly argue that like feeling like butter or dairy or cake is Mm. or sugar, processed sugars, whatever are bad. Um, That's definitely a taught belief, right? That's so, Mm. so taught in our society that Mm. sugar is addictive and it's more addictive than yeah. cocaine and that you you know you can be addicted to <laughs> yes. these foods there's a ton of yes. crazy information out there right. so i would say that <laughs> mindful eating would be allowing yourself to have those things and if your body still doesn't want them or crave them then you're being intuitive and you're listening if there's a birthday party or a cake at the grocery store and it just looks really delicious and amazing again, almost honoring that I hunger that like that looks really good. And there's a reason for that. There's a part of me that would enjoy having that. If there is no part of you that wants it, 
um, I would, you know, that would not be intuitive to force yourself to eat it just to prove you have a healthy relationship with food. <laughs> yes. Right. right. <laughs> oh, I love the way you say that. It's kind of fun and playful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, food, not having morals, yeah, and all these yeah. ideas we have. <laughs> I love that. Totally. It's all so complicated and it's all so like really ingrained in us too. Diet culture goes way, way back. And so pushing past some of that and really being able to say some people, for example, just don't enjoy breakfast or it doesn't you know, serve their body, but they have a really big lunch or some people just aren't sweets people or aren't salty food people. And, you know, to force yourself to have those things would not be healthy either, but to not allow yourself to have those things, um, is not intuitive, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Yeah, it does, right. Yeah. And I do feel like sometimes, not often, but when my husband buys cakes and all, and then I have it because it looks good and smells good, of course. Yep. But then after I eat it, I don't feel right. I have nightmares. Interesting. So I have those visions that they are not positive every time I eat sugar. So I'm wondering if that's coming from a belief system too, because sometimes we believe so much in something that ended up becoming our reality. Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking when you say that. So that's really interesting. Yeah. So you might be right, Chelsea. Who knows? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Cause kind of, it's almost like, um, creating your own reality, right? Like if you feel like something is bad and then you've done the bad thing, yeah, it would make sense to maybe have bad nightmares or bad thoughts or images or whatever. Right. Yeah. 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 And then I have, of course, less energy and all that. And then I yeah. blame on the cake. Oh, that was the cake. And then I don't have that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so what an interesting dance. <laughs> and that's one of my favorite topics, intuition and now mm-hmm. intuitive eating, of course, cause it's part of that. It's just being natural. That just, um, it's very attractive and very close. It resonates true to me, this idea of just navigating this reality in a natural way, just flowing yeah. with it and not trying to push anything away. Absolutely. And I think too, when I think about the intuitive eating, it's been so fascinating to, again, to go back to this kind of with watching my daughter with food, because we'll yeah. give her a plate full of you know, I don't know, vegetables and a pasta and a, she kind of covers all her food groups and we always present her with dessert. And sometimes she eats the dessert first, the cookies first, and sometimes she doesn't touch them. And it's kind of fascinating to see that, you know, she chose to eat all her broccoli today and not touch the cookies because she hasn't learned that like cookies are bad and bro- or you know, and broccoli is good. She's just eating what she's craving or what looks good in that moment. And so that's really interesting. I think that's like the fundamental where we all started at some point and then it gets really mucky along the way where there's all these food rules. Yeah. Oh, wow. I love that idea. Just putting the food in front of us yeah. on a table and see what the body will go for it. Exactly. That's amazing. Oh, I right? love that idea. Because your body talks to you in so many ways. It's just we've kind of lost sight of listening. That's a beautiful practice. Do you actually experiment that with your clients? Do you, um, oh, yeah, you do that absolutely. in a way? Yep. Oh yeah. my God. I love yeah. that idea. And sometimes we'll call it food exposure. So similar to like if someone had, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder and you would be doing exposures, um, a classic one, right. is like, you can't leave the house without touching the doorknob three times or whatever, like the classic OCD symptom, you would do the exposure of saying, okay, let's leave the house and not touch the doorknob. So we do kind of the same with food. You know, I'll have my clients often make a food hierarchy where like, what are your safe foods? What are your, you know, I will not eat that food ever. I'm so scared of it. And what foods fall in the middle? And let's start doing some exposures on having some of those fear foods be part of your meals, even if you're just plating it and looking at it and not actually able to eat it yet. Um, You know, that's all exposure to like reintroducing foods that we really can become like fearful of foods. It's it's fascinating. I have heard something interesting. I interviewed somebody, Eloisa Ramos, recently. She's a healer. And she does, what is the uh, modality? I think it's uh, EFT. And then she said, the goal of all healing is to release fear. Mm, it resonated I love that. so true to me, Chelsea. Yes, yeah. Because we, we do, we adapt all these different fears that sometimes they have no basis, but they're just there because, you know, we've been taught them. We have no actual lived experience or reason to fear this thing. It's never actually hurt us or anything. Um, but yeah, we, we just kind of create these fears sometimes. I love that for some reason, this idea that the goal of healing is to release fears. Yeah, I love uh, that too. Yeah, it resonated true. So we're almost at the end. I do have a few more questions for you, the ending questions. But before that, the other blog post that you sent me that's very interesting too, is about the cognitive distortions identified in 
CBT. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I would love for you to talk to me for a moment about that, perhaps the most interesting ones. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I kind of like to think of them as thought traps or, you know, they are distorted ways of thinking that we all have. And once you can put a name to it and recognize it, you kind of have so much more power in challenging it and changing it. And so one of the ones, it's actually the first one on this blog post, but um, I love it. And it's all or nothing Mm -hmm, thinking or, yep, (laughs) I'll call it black and white thinking. Yeah. And it's just kind of believing that things exist with, you know, these polar opposites. So something's either good or bad, similar to food, right? Food is either good or bad, or your day was great, or it was terrible, or you're a success or a failure. And really being able to find and live in that gray area, because so much of life is in the gray area. But we, we've we kind of learned to somewhere along the way to live in these, you know, all or nothing scenarios. And, and it can be so detrimental, because if you label something as just good or bad, you kind of miss so much opportunity to, oh, that thing was kind of okay, or right? Right? it was all right. It wasn't the best. It wasn't the worst, but it was still not bad. And and we find, I think, a lot more value in things when you can place it in that gray area. When you say gray area, I think about balance. Yes, exactly. Right? Exactly. That's a very, very powerful message yeah. that we do tend to do that. Some of us, yeah, all or nothing, the extremes, right? No yep, balance. The extremes. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of, you know, our society these days is just excre- extremes. You have to be an expert or something and you, or you know nothing about it. And there's just so much in between mm-hmm. that we forget about. Yeah. I love that. Beautifully said, Chelsea. Thank, Thank you. you so much for that wisdom. Of course. Yeah. That's very powerful and empowering. Let's see my ending questions. Before that, would you like to add anything else that we left unsaid for today's conversation? I don't conversation? think so. I think we covered a lot. So, okay, I'll go to my last questions and let me look for which ones. I'll ask you this one. What do you love most about being in a human body? Being in a human body, I think my ability to get to know other people and help other people and also continue to learn more about myself, like allowing the space and the grace to continue evolving and changing. Um, and, and I think just reflecting back on that experience, kind of to look back on where you started and, and to have hopes on where you're going, but to honor the moment that you're in. I think all of that is just such a, a blessing and a really great thing. And, and being able to, again, help other people and touch other people in a positive way while also you know, learning and growing yourself. What is another word for life? What comes to mind? For life? Um, hmm, that's a tough one. I, I'm, what's coming to mind for me is experience. Like it's an experience. I don't know that, that we're constantly experiencing ourselves and situations and relationships and things and so it's all it's all just an experience mm, I love that too thank you <laughs> what is not to love about that answer <laughs> ah, and with that in mind and heart what three experiences you wish everyone to have before they lose the body before they die mm. um, three experiences I would say to experience love being given love and to love someone else whether that's a friend or a pet or a partner or whatever. I think love is a really important experience. Um, I think helping, being able to serve or help someone else or a community of people or serving or helping in some ways a really important and, you know, healing experience for all of us. Um, and I'm trying to think of a third experience. Hmm. I guess learning in any capacity is a is a great experience, whether that's formal learning at school or just being able, again, kind of back to like that awareness, being able to learn about yourself and learn and grow. I think that's an important experience. Mm, yeah, I love them all. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my God. Thank you for being present and open to this conversation. Of course. And thank you for what you do, how you do it, this beautiful intention to help others in finding purpose and meaning in doing that. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for I've having me. I've learned from you quite a lot today. I'm so glad. Yes. <laughs> so before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your work, services, and future projects? 
Yeah, I have a Psychology Today profile. So that's an excellent resource for anyone looking to find a therapist. Um, So I'm on Psychology Today. If you went on that website and just typed in your zip code, it'll give you therapists in your area. I'm in Middletown, Connecticut. Um, And then I also have a website of my own. That's C. DeChico Counseling. Um, And that would bring you right to my personal website. Wonderful. Or if you just Googled my name, it would pop up too. Yeah, I'll have the link, your website link on your podcast profile. Perfect. Thank you so much again, and we'll talk soon. Bye for now. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Chelsea DeChico and her work, please visit chelseadechicocounseling.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.